Well, good morning, everybody. We certainly got off to a strong start yesterday with a depth, sec depth, and a series of panels that were absolutely spectacular, brought to, for, brought to the fore. A lot of key issues, kind of got, you all got the insights of several of the key leaders here in the Navy and the Marine Corps is uh, they chart the, the future for us. And today promises to be every bit as promising and successful as it was yesterday. I'm going to introduce our uh, morning keynote speaker here um, in just a, a second. But I, I want to uh, give a little bit of a preface to this introduction to say that about 30 years ago, I believe it was, if my math is close to being right, uh, General Al Gray, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, went about a major restructuring of the Marine Corps. He took a lot of the function out of the headquarters. His f famous line was, your worst enemy is your next higher headquarters. And to, you know, to him, he wanted to make sure that he had a lean headquarters in Washington. But he also wanted to make sure that the Marine Corps was focused on the issues and the topics of the day and to try to streamline some of that process. And in the course of doing so, he created an organization down at Quantico, Quantico which we now call McCidic, the Marine Corps Combat Development Command. And if you look at the portfolio of that command, it is absolutely enormous. And it touches every aspect of every Marine from boot camp right on through to war fighting and, and the things that we do as a profession. I'm going to introduce the, uh, the commanding general of the the commander of the uh, Marine Corps Combat Development Command. Um, but again, as I said, he's got a huge portfolio. Everything from, inf he and his subordinates, everything from information warfare, future warfighting concepts that the Marine Corps has to integrate with the other services and the Navy as well, um, analysis of how we fight and the things that need to be brought to the bear, the training and education structure within the Marine Corps, Capabilities Development Center. Uh, he's got to develop the uh, capabilities. And he's also got the Recruit Depot. So as you can see from that, that and there's several items, other items in there that could go on forever. And we've been blessed over time in the Marine Corps to have superb officers, in our, not the least of which is a gentleman now serving as the Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, Jim Mattis. But today we're gonna have as a, uh, our keynote speaker, Lieutenant General Bob Walsh. And Bob is a Naval Academy grad who started his career as a grunt and figured out in an early age it was a lot easier and a lot faster to get point A to point B by flying rather than walking. Um, he quickly learned it. Um, he, he's had multiple command tours to include MAG-31 down at Beaufort, 2nd Maw, deployed the 2nd Maw forward into OIF and followed that up as a tour as a J-3 in the Northern Command. He's the director of expeditionary for, where, uh, excuse me. He was the director of expeditionary warfare on the CNO staff, and as I said before, he's now currently the commanding general of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command. He's a gentleman that brings a broad spectrum of, from a warfighting perspective, a joint perspective, and a naval perspective. There's no one who's probably better qualified for the job, and there's no one better here uh, qualified to talk to you about where the Marine Corps is and the work, where the Marine Corps is going today than uh, General Whaler Walsh. So, General, would you please come up here and take the stand? Okay. Hey. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, General Shea and uh, Admiral Daly, AFCIA, uh, USNI, really to pull this together. Just a uh, great opportunity to get everybody thinking about the future together. Uh, and we never can get enough together with our industry partners. So this is a, a really great, great privilege to be here and address you today. First thing I'd like to say coming from Washington is the weather's gorgeous here. So we're so happy to be here. They're on a weather delay back there, but we're here enjoying San Diego. But really more important than that, what I want to tell you is coming from D.C. is I can't tell you I've done five tours in the Pentagon, and I've never felt as much synergy and energy coming from the leadership that I'm feeling today, right now, coming directly from Secretary of Defense Mattis and also uh, Chairman Dunford. Uh, it's exactly what we need, and they're putting us on a sound course. Um, I would encourage everybody out here to read um, the National Defense Strategy. Uh, that's kind of our playbook on where we're heading. That, along with our Marine Corps operating concept, those two documents will kind of give you clear direction on where we're, go where we're going with Marine Corps Force 2025 20 and beyond. And 
I think it's been a path that when General Neller came in, he took a clear look at what the operating environment was, what the threats were out there, how we were configured, and reorganized what we're looking at today. And so I will say that I think that General Neller's got us on a good path. I think we're out in front, and that's why I think we're very comfortable with what uh, is in the, uh, the NDS. Um, if you can go to the next slide. What I would start off with here is the operating environment is driving everything we do. The Marine Corps operating concept uh, inside there, we've got five key drivers to change in there. And it starts off with complex terrain, and in Marines in a lot of ways we define that as urban littorals. Not just urban, but littorals. That environment is this complex terrain that we operate in. Um, the technology proliferation that we see today the rapid tech advances that we're seeing today is changing the character of war. I'll say that again. It is changing the character of war. Um, information as a weapon. Uh, we've got a thing, um, General Shea mentioned um, General Gray, and we have a thing, it's called our, it's really our Bible on war fighting. It's MCDP-1, it's war fighting. That's what the title of the, the document is. And we have only revised that document twice. We're in the process of cracking that open and see whether we need to revise it again. And the only reason is because what's going on in the information area. And that's why we're looking at it, because we think as Marines, maneuver warfare is who we are. And we believe the information environment is going to keep our speed tempo up and be able to maneuver in new ways on the battlefield. Um, and the last one is a contested maritime environment. And I think this is a key one with the national defense strategy that we've just received. Everywhere the Navy and Marine Corps team's gonna go globally, we're gonna be contested. I mean, just read the news last Thursday, SU-27 in the Black Sea, um, flying up close, too close, to one of our EP-3s. That's a contested maritime environment. That's the environment we're gonna be seeing more and more into the future. Um, one of the things at uh, Quantico we've, we've looked at and studied very hard with our Army partners, I'm sure we've got some soldiers out here, but we've looked at very closely what's going on in uh, Europe and in Ukraine specifically, in eastern Ukraine. And we've dissected that a lot and looked at what goes on there. And I think if you take a look at those operations of a contested environment, terrain's taken, um, surface to air missile capabilities are put up to deny a government's use of their own aircraft. Uh, and then using sophisticated electronic warfare detection, comms jamming, um, and drones that are put up to quickly use that detection and emissions to quickly target and use artillery to uh, rain down fires on entire battalions. When I take a look at our Marines who have been in Iraq and Afghanistan, whether it's a put a special purpose MAGTAF, a Marine Expeditionary uh, Unit into an environment like that today, I think we would probably struggle in that type of complex environment based on where we've been and the good work we've been doing over the last uh, 17 years. So I think as we look at it, gone are the days really of uncontested um, superiority that we've really had. And this reemergence of long-term strategic competition uh, and we'll see where that competition takes us. But there's no question when you look at China that China has a grand strategy. And I would follow that up with is now with the national defense strategy, we now in the Department of Defense have a very clear strategy on uh, where we're headed. Um, and it's clearly in that document, it defines China as a strategic competitor. We've kind of gone back and forth for many, many years on what, what it is very clear in the NDS that China's a strategic competitor. Uh, and knowing Secretary Mattis, we're gonna compete. And so that's, uh, that's what we're gonna do. So as I think I look at this, I look at a lot of our um, officers today, and I look at where we are today and our young Marines. Uh, and you look back, really, uh, one of the things at Marine Corps University that I do, I go down and I play a video on the PLA. And I'll just give you a a small snippet of that video. And the reason I do that is these Marines today, they're all war fighters, but they haven't been operating and fighting at that high end. And so when they look at it, they've been in combat deployment after combat deployment. But when I look at this video, I kind of fall back into my early days as a young officer, 
and I remember back, and I almost feel comfortable with looking at the video and going, I remember the Soviet Union. I knew the capabilities they developed. I knew when they developed it. I knew we studied it. We knew their order battle inside out. We knew their capabilities, what frequencies they operated on. And we used American industry to get better and always stay ahead of them. And so I'm very comfortable going, we can compete in that environment. That is not hard to do. We can go bad at that. But our sergeants, our lieutenants, they don't know that environment at all. They know ISIL, they know AQI, they know the Taliban very well. So I'll just play this video and I ask you to take a look at the things that they're focused on, cyber, electronic warfare, air defense, those kind of things that are gonna be, keep us out that they know asymmetrically that it is an area that they may have an advantage against us. And we can go into other things like artificial intelligence and hypersonic weapons too. But just if you'd play this video, please. Here comes the ground formations. The tank formation, Major General Yao Wang. There are 22 99A tanks, the latest generation of main battlefield tanks. Major General Meng Mingrong is leading the drone formation. It includes drones for communication jamming, radar jamming, and counter radiation. And these are the air defense and Anton missile combat group, the electronic countermeasure formation. The electronic countermeasures disrupts or cripples enemy information systems with electromagnetic spectrum or radiation. The service to air missile formation and we are seeing HQ-9B and HQ-22 missiles. They make a powerful defense combined together. Now we are seeing O-9 self-prepared anti-aircraft guns, HQ-6 missile launchers, and track anti-aircraft guns. In the first formation of naval missiles. Weapons displayed here include the HHQ-9B ship-to-air and YJ-12A ship-to-ship missiles. We're looking at the YJ-83K air-to-ship missiles and YJ-62A short-to-ship missiles. Overhead now is the air battle group. They're a new type of median long-range strategic bombers that China has independently developed. You're looking at the carrier-based J-15 fighter jets. They're domestically designed and operate on China's first aircraft carrier, the Liaoning. Um, the fighter jets in the lead is the J-20, China's fourth generation supersonic stealth fighter. J-16 and J-11B stealth fighters. They have superior performance in electronic warfare. The J-16 is making its public debut. The last, and perhaps the most important, the nuclear missile formation. So I, again, I, I play that really for our students at the university, just to kind of show them what is out there in the different world that they've been used to. So it's not like, you know, we're beating drums to go to war, but the def defense guidance is very clear that we're gonna compete. We're not gonna allow others to be a global power and, and push us around. So this competition is back, and I think as you take a look at those capabilities, you'll probably agree that we've got a long way to go in many, many areas that, uh, that some of our um, uh, competitors have been developing over the years. Um, when you look at the strategy and the guidance, you know, again, I would say Marines like guidance. We got clear guidance. So we've got marching orders, we know which direction we're heading. Um, Secretary Mattis said it's the most complex uh, era he's seen in almost, uh, in, in over 40 years that he's been around. And he said, uh, in the past we must build a more lethal force. Keyword lethal, it's very clear in the uh, NDS that uh, lethality is a key piece of where we're heading. And it's a key piece of our force development part that we're working very hard on. General Dunford said that uh, we'll lose our competitive advantage in five years if we don't modernize. And, uh, and again, I think we're ahead in this way of thinking. 
So as we looked at that and put together the Marine Corps operating concept, looked at where we were at, one of the key things we drove down to is, what is our Title X responsibilities? Who are we? What should we be? And it was very clear um, that, that we should be partnered with our Navy brothers and sisters and be part of that Naval team. So this is, I th say, is driven an awakening within the Naval forces. Uh, it's continuing, and I think the National Defense Strategy is going to continue to drive us in that direction. In the Marine Corps operating concept, the first task that we put in there um, is to integrate the Naval force to operate at and from the sea. First thing the Commandant wanted in there, with the Navy to operate at and from the sea. Key part, at and from the sea, uh, and not just on land. Um, and naval integration is a key driver in everything we're doing now. I co-chair the Naval Board uh, up at the Pentagon with all you know, three stars with um, Vice Admiral Woody Lewis. Uh, every month, the three stars meet along with um, the deputies from the deputy from Fleet Forces Command and the Commander Marine Forces Command, along with the admirals and generals at Pentagon. Once a month, we meet, and we bring issues to we try to make decisions on, and then once a quarter we tee those issues up for the Commandant and the CNO at the Naval Board. So the Naval Board has been driving, the CNO has been driving us together as a force with strategic direction that, uh, that we need to go. So getting clear guidance in that. I think a key thing that's coming out of all our war games, all our experiments, all our uh, concepts that we're writing is that the, uh, this expeditionary force that we have between the Navy and the Marine Corps, um, the Marines need to be part of that sea control and maritime power projection capabilities. If you look at the National uh, Defense Strategy, it talks about two things that I think the Marines and the sailors fit in very well to. It's contact and blunt forces. Those contact forces are those key forces that are forward deployed, already on station, uh, that help compete more effectively below the level of conflict. And then the blunt forces, those contact forces, then are able to turn into those blunt forces that can delay, degrade, or deny uh, adversary aggression. So when you talk about the NDS of compete, um, deter, and win, that is exactly what that compete, deter part is your forward deployed naval forces to be ready, to be on scene, to be able to uh, enable those surge forces that come in as those war winning forces. A struggle we've had though is balancing readiness and modernization. Um, when you take a look at that, the op tempo is really a key piece that's really been eating us in many, many ways. And the same thing with, uh, no question, our sailors and our ships. Um, as you take a look at that, when you look at competing against a higher end threat and changing your mission to be more competitive in that environment, you're going to have to train to higher levels of warfare. So one of the things we need is more time back home for our forces to be able to train to the higher end capabilities that we haven't done in a long time. An example I'll use is myself as an F-18 pilot. As a young pilot, I probably knew that harm high-speed anti-radiation missile better than I did my gun. In, class, in a lot of ways, the, uh, the 20 millimeter on the gun, we wondered why, we'd, if, would we ever use that gun? But we certainly used that harm missile all the time and knew that thing inside out and all the frequencies the threat operated on and were very good in electronic warfare. The Marines today, a lot of them probably have seldom, if ever, even carried a harm missile. Um, but they're very good with their gun. So when you shift gears to a high end, it changes your training, it changes your force, and it changes where you're, uh, you're heading in a lot of ways. Um, talk a little bit about modernization and readiness that, uh, that balance. With the BCA that we've had been going on, we've deferred about $42 million over the last six billion dollars over the last 16 years that we could have been putting towards uh, modernization. Uh, no question, speaker after speaker will get up here and say the same thing. The BCA caps have to end. Uh, it's, it's doing nothing but hurting uh, your Department of Defense uh, and certainly continuing resolutions, 10 out of the last 11 years, this is certainly not a way to operate and be happy that you've got a CR signed. I will tell you, I've got programs sitting on the shelf right now that I've been waiting since October 1st to get out there and start using, but we can't do that because we're waiting for a budget in, uh, in some of the new start initiatives. So as I look at that from, from, from that negative side, I will say the economy is moving in the right direction. We can see that. It, you know, it's starting, the engine's starting to rev and we're moving in a good direction. Last year in 18, we got a 3% increase in our budget. Uh, 
General Dunford said that a 3% increase will not build the force that we need, that we probably need at least 5%. Um, so we've been working hard towards that to try to increase that, uh, that budget level. I think you're going to see that uh, here um, when the budget rolls out. We're waiting to see what the Secretary of Defense brings out, what senior, senior leadership show us. But we've been given clear guidance to continue to move towards modernization, to push in that direction of modernizing the force. And in my own world, last year in 18, we put in, inside uh, the, the President's budget, we put in about 10% more than from 17 into modernization. So there was an increase just in our modernization accounts of 10% last year. I want to increase that and almost try to double that this year coming up in 19. So the goal is to keep pushing more towards that modernization uh, while we maintain the, uh, the readiness that we have and, uh, and ideally reduce some of the op tempo that we've been on. So I don't think there's any question, if you look at the, the leadership across the Pentagon, uh, it's all about modernizing faster. Next slide. I touched on uh, concepts. Uh, the concepts really do drive us. They drive everything we do. We're a concepts-based requirement system. The concepts are what's going to defeat an adversary's strategy. You don't want to defeat their systems. You want to defeat their strategy. So our concepts are really are the drivers in that, and a Marine Corps operating concept is one that we've been working on. Uh, the other one is littoral operations in a contested environment. Uh, last fall, the Commandant and the CNO signed that concept. That concept between those two leaders is driving the two forces together. It's driving our war games, it's driving our experiments, it's driving our fleet exercises. Uh, inside that concept, we've got 18 tasks that they tasked us with, and on the Naval Board, we track every one of those tasks on uh, ensuring we're meeting the end state of what the Commandant and the CNO want. So that's an area, too, this, the, the littoral ops in a contested environment, and very much, again, in that concept, the Marine Corps focused on sea control, sea denial as part of a naval campaign and a joint campaign with the Navy. Uh, a lot of focus on distributed forces. I talked about the Ukraine battlefield. It's no different out at sea. You're going to have to distribute and aggregate at the right time and place. Um, but to be able to do that, you've got to be able to have ships that are highly capable to operate in that type of uh, distributed manner. And within um, the Marine Corps, we just had an offsite. We had all our three and four stars work a, um, a war game that focused heavily on littoral ops and contested environment and expeditionary advanced base operations. And now moving from that with the senior leadership going into my Palm War 20 war game, we're going to go after in Palm 20. The next Palm that we're building is to look in that direction, which we think is exactly lined up with those two concepts with what the NDS is doing. So that's the direction that uh, we're heading with, with all the things we're doing. Marine Corps Force 2025, when we put the Marine Corps operating concept out, um, we then drove into about uh, a year and a half process of redesigning the force. And uh, we started in August of last year putting the structure in place to slowly evolve that force to build Marine Corps Force 2025. It's not going to all happen at once, but changes are taking place already. I'll give you one example on information warfare capabilities. Uh, we stood up in our Marine Corps Expeditionary Forces, our main warfighting headquarters, we stood up our MEF uh, information groups. That pulled together within the MEF headquarters all of our capabilities that are in the information uh, environment that we have. So when you start looking at things like um, cyber, EW, signals intelligence, information operations, military deception, all of those kind of things are all together under one uh, commander, one colonel commander inside those MIGs that reports to the MEF commander and the MEF COC. That is, again, back to the concept of driving maneuver warfare in completely different ways. Uh, the Commandant also stood up a Deputy Commandant for Information, Lieutenant General Dan O'Donohue, uh, counterpart with um, Vice Admiral Ty, who was, uh, I think it was here yesterday and is here today, is the N2N6. Uh, Long-range precision fires or weapons is our second priority, followed up by air and missile defense capabilities. C2 to operate in a degraded environment, uh, which is a key part of working very closely with the Navy on. Protected mobility and enhanced maneuver, and then finally, tactical logistics of distributed operations. Next slide. One of the key parts of um, us moving forward is out innovating our adversaries. 
And I think the Marine Corps has always been a very innovative force, and I think we're following uh, in that footsteps. Um, one of the things that we've stood back up is we have not done a lot of experimentation in the last, uh, since really 9-11, and so we stood up Sea Dragon. For those of you back in that are here, you remember back in the 80s and 90s, we did a lot of service level focused, get the entire Corps focused in one area uh, to ensure that the Marine Corps was moving in the right direction. Commandants did that back up in uh, 2016, and um, just this last year, year and a half really, we took 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, made them an experimentation force. The very unique part of that experimentation force is we deployed them to the Western Pacific uh, and put them on USS WASP out there uh, and also operated as part of Talisman Saver. Pretty gutsy move when you think about it. Take an experimentation force, we reconfigured every company in different ways. We gave them different equipment, different robotics, different weapon systems, did a, different electronic warfare capabilities, and we gave that to them and deployed them uh, and potentially could have went into combat operations with that force. We learned a lot from that force, and just two weeks ago, we outbriefed the Commandant uh, on that. During that 18 months, we did five live force experiments with them. Um, we had, out of those young Marines uh, and, and uh, leaders, we had 34 recommendations that they presented. We've accepted 31 of them. We're still looking at three, and we've actually programmed 21 of those recommendations and are moving out on those recommendations. Uh, it's weapons, unmanned air and ground systems, tactical EW capabilities, and decision making down to uh, tactical networks down to the lowest level. Uh, one of the things that, if you look at the NDS, um, Secretary Mattis, with his background, no surprise that he would be focused on close combat. And if you look at our Marines and a lot of soldiers, our SEALs, special operators, they're the ones in many cases that are taking the casualties in combat, and it's always been that way. So to put a more of an emphasis on close combat, he has put together a team up there at uh, OSD that the services are participating in in close combat, uh, and how we can improve that capability. And I think our sea dragging um, work as we bring this report forward and we brief on what we do, and I think it's going to be a major effort to help that go forward. Um, yeah, yeah, about a couple months ago, we heard Admiral McRaven talk, and I'm, I know everybody in here respects Admiral McRaven, and one of the things that he said that I found was very interesting, he said that in his life he had five truths. And one of those truths, he said, is what the Marines did in Sea Dragon after Desert Storm. And I, I found that interesting that Admiral McRaven was aware of some of the things that we were doing. But what he said was that the Marines had taken a concept and some ideas to try to get information on uh, personal device assistance, Blue Force Tracker, try to share information and get fires down to the individual Marines uh, and be able to get that out to squad leaders to make decisions. And he said, the experiment failed, but the idea was there, and when the technology can catch up with the idea, then the idea is going to be successful, and it allows the concept to be successful and the force to move in a new way. He said that when 2011 rolled around, and he was the commander of Special Operations Command, and at that time he did the Bin Laden raid and was successful in that, he thought back and said, I remember what those Marines were doing in Sea Dragon. That's exactly the capability that I have today. And why we were successful today was those ideas that they were professing back then came forward. So I think some of the things we're trying to do today in uh, Sea Dragon is going to move us forward in new ways. The model that we're using right now that I find very successful so far, and it's new, is using our advanced naval technology experiments. And what we do with that is we partner with the Navy. We partner with uh, the Navy's uh, RDT&E effort. I partner with... Uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, RDT&E, Bray. We pull the warfare centers together. We pull industry together, uh, solve a, try to solve a problem, and see where the technology can take us. Last year, we did the ship-to-shore maneuver, Antex. Uh, and in that, as Marines, we were looking at the threat and people questioning on how we were going to get ashore differently in the future. And what we looked at with that scenario was it's not just going to be Amtrak's online. We've got to think differently. But we didn't tell anybody to divide a high, high water speed vessel. What we asked them to do is help us figure out how we can get ashore differently in different ways in the future. And we brought industry together, the 10 Navy Warfare Centers together. Uh, and in at Camp Pendleton at Red Beach last May, 
we demonstrated over 100 different capabilities that they brought forward. And the thing that, that really changed my thinking why these things were so valuable was when I sat up on the hill at Red Beach and looked at the, the landings taking place, if you would even call them landings, is what we watched for probably the first 15 to 20 minutes, and I stood there with the Secretary of the Navy and the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and we watched almost everything was unmanned. It was completely different than anything that I had really envisioned of how we would conduct amphibious operations. Um, and so I think that was an example of that. We then, from the model, took that, those capabilities that we saw that were successful and moved some of them into Bold Alligator 17 and into Dawn Blitz 17, using those technologies and putting them into the hands of our Marines and seeing what the Marines now thought rather than using them in a more of an experiment closed set with our Marine Corps Warfighting Lab and our contractors. And out of that, we found a lot of capabilities that we want, and we're moving forward towards a, a program of record. So sometimes it'll inform requirements. Sometimes we can move forward more rapidly with it. And one of the reasons we've stood up is the Rapid Capabilities Office inside the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. Um, this March in, in uh, Camp Pendleton, and then in August at um, Mass, uh, um, Mattatsasek up in uh, Indiana at an urban combat uh, center that the National Guard has up there, we're going to do our fifth generation urban advanced naval technology exercise. So we're doing the same thing again, this time in an urban environment and using all industry and our warfare centers to come up with better ways to operate in the urban environment. And that's progressing very well. Uh, in, in 18, this year, our focus is on logistics and our logistics combat element. So our Sea Dragon focus for this year, where last year was on the ground combat element, this year it's on logistics and hybrid logistics and, and, uh, and trying to move better in that direction. Next year it's going to be on information environment operations, and in 20 we're going to focus on expeditionary advanced base operations. Next slide. Let me think. I think we, can you go back one? I think we. I'll just, okay, I, I, we've got one uh, slide I've got missing, but I'll just talk to you about is uh, the, go, I tell you, go forward two. Let me see if maybe they've got it out of order. One more. Okay, yeah, go back. I, I can go that way. Um, go back to the slide you had just for, yes. So let me talk about amphibious ships. Um, very critical if we're going to be a naval force. Uh, and op operate to and from the sea, we've got to have the right ships. So I will look at today the ships that we've got going from uh, our LPD to the LXR. We're very comfortable with what that ship's going to be and the warfighting capability that's going to be, be able to bring to be able to operate at a higher level end than, say, our LSDs in the past would have operated, to be able to operate exactly what we've done in this type of operating environment we've got in front of us. The LHAs today that we just, uh, America just came back from a deployment, Tripoli is well into being built and, and uh, it will be delivered here shortly. And then Bougainville, the contract was signed for that last year. So we've got three great LHAs that are coming our way. Um, and what I'll stress is um, we've got to have a shipbuilding plan that continues to eliminate our amphibious shortfalls and working very closely with the CNO and the Navy uh, as that shipbuilding plan will probably roll out with the budget next week to try to develop that shipbuilding plan that will support the amphibs we need. But a key part of that plan is not only needing the numbers of ships that we need that were short of that requirement, but also the capability on those ships. So if we're going to operate in accordance with littoral ops in a contested environment, or to be able to operate against a high-end threat in distributed maritime operations, those ships working with expeditionary advanced bases need to have high-end capabilities to be able to stand in and operate also with the rest of the force, with the, uh, uh, um, uh, the crew des force uh, also. So I think that's a key part of it. One of the things we've driven in real hard at the Naval Board is the fleet tactical grid. And how does the Marine Corps tie into that fleet tactical grid? And this is a real challenge. For 16 years, 17 years, the Marines have been focused on a tactical grid that's been in overland in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Navy's been very focused on a fleet tactical grid, focused more on the high end, operating more in composite warfare command in a whole different construct than we've been looking at. 
So now as we come back together and try to bring that together and try to operate in new ways, we quickly see that there's a lot of work to be able to done that Admiral Tai and General Donahue are working feverishly along with the fleet and our Mar Force to be able to tie that grid together in a detailed kill chain approach to enable to ensure that we've got uh, interoperability and con conductivity. And I'll tell you, I think the Marines bring some tremendous capabilities to that fight. You know, some of the aviation capabilities we have right now, some of our electronic warfare and signals intelligence capabilities are very high end uh, to help with that problem. The F-35 is a complete game changer for the Marine Corps and the Navy. That VMFA-121 going to deploy on WASP this year will be a game changer in the Pacific. Um, so bringing in that capability and what that needs to have on those ships to be able to use the capability F-35 to enhance the capability of the ARG ships, ARG ship, our amphibious ships, and also the cruiser and destroyers that are out there also. We're learning a lot from what we're doing with the F-35B to help us with what we're doing with the F-35C on our carriers uh, in moving that forward. Another one that we need on the, uh, on the, the, uh, uh, the ARG side is a Group 5 unmanned aerial system. So a program that we're working right now very hard on is our MAGTAF Unmanned Expeditionary Group 5 program uh, and trying to figure out what the requirements, what those capabilities should be. And again, working partnered with industry, we're going to bring in, just like we did on our advanced reconnaissance vehicle, we're going to bring in industry, we're going to have a symposium, we're going to look at what the requirements really should be, what do we need in that capability to try to neck those capabilities down or requirements before we go forward with our AOA study. What we're hearing from industry right now is we're asking for too much out of that uh, platform. And we want to ensure we've got that. So when you look at the strategy we've got today from the Secretary of Defense, some of the things like um, airborne early warning and those sort of capabilities, our uh, ISR are going to be the things that we need front and foremost to be operate in a contested environment. Next slide. I think I've talked enough about uh, you know, industry and working with them. What I would just say on this is everybody is telling us to go faster, everybody. I think the, industry thing, the interesting thing I'm saying is Congress is giving us the law to go faster, but what I suspected was we'd be our worst own enemy. It would be the processes in place within DOD that would slow things down. So the thing that's kind of really kind of I found very interesting watching is those senior leaders that uh, the departments brought in. And if you look across the board at almost every one of those key places that have to do with acquisition and going faster, um, the Secretary of Defense has brought in key people from business. And I am in meetings with them all the time, and I'm very impressed how they look at our process and just want to break them down, knock them down to be able to go faster. They're questioning just about everything we're doing on how we do it. And that's a brush of fresh air. It's got some of our requirements people and our acquisition folks going, OK, we're a little uncomfortable with this. But I think the intent is right, and I think we're going to continue to move in the right direction. Next slide. And then I couldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our individual Marines. If you look at the Marine Corps operating concept, the last task we have there is the enhance, the uh, exploit the competence of the individual Marine. Uh, our Marines and sailors, they truly are our asymmetric advantage. You put the type of capabilities on these ships in their hands, we've seen it with our experiments uh, with 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. Uh, at the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, we brought in a bunch of sergeants to work inside the lab to help us with innovating with technology and new ideas. Uh, and they're making a huge difference. It's the older folks that are the ones that are more uncomfortable with this. Uh, one example here I've got in this 2-6 decision room is to be able to, uh, a battalion down there brought into their barracks, brought a bunch of gaming capability. We help with O&R, brought in uh, software in there to help them with that gaming capability. And they've used that now to war game themselves in their barracks. We gave them HoloLens capability to go out and, and quadcopters to be able to map the terrain, to be able to put 3D maps together so they could rehearse those capabilities, um, gave them instrumented capabilities for their weapons and uh, each individual Marine so they can debrief and come back in and continue to war game and exploit and how to get their tactics better. 
This is a completely different generation that we've had in the past. And it wasn't top-down driven, this was bottom-up driven. They wanted it, they put it together, they developed it, we, I was told to fund it. Uh, so that's where the stuff's coming from. Um, last sli uh, next slide. And it's my last slide. So where are we going? Naval integration. Uh, deterrence, sea control, and force projection. That's where our focus is, and that's quite a change from where we've been in the past. Optimizing for peer competition. Um, need to improve our warship capability and capacity. Uh, need to regain our air and surface fires advantage, and also our expeditionary air and missile defense capability. I talked about protecting the fleet tactical grid and integrating with that. As the Commandant always says, our C2 is our center of gravity. And that in a high-end fight, as you saw in the video, those are going to be the capabilities that they're going to go after. Generating information warfare, um, and I think we're well on the way to do that. Using manned and unmanned teaming is certainly going to be the way of the future, and we saw that in our Sea Dragon experiments. And then finally, I would say leveraging the technology, leveraging industry, putting the right capabilities in the hands of this innovative uh, uh, generation of sailors and Marines is, is what's going to make us successful. Uh, and with that, I'll open it up for some questions. Go ahead, sir. Morning, General. I'm Shane Dykeman with Teledyne Brown Engineering, and I appreciate your comments about synergy, especially with the joint force. 20 years ago, when I was a Lieutenant General Beak Howell's science advisor at Bar 4 PAC, we had that same desire with all of the bringing the Marine Corps War Fighting Lab, Maritime Battle Center, Army Battle Labs, Air Force Battle Labs into one cohesive force. Next month, the Association of the U.S. Army is convening a Global Force Symposium in Huntsville, Alabama. They're going to roll out the Army Futures Command. Sounds a lot like McCitic. They're only about 30 years too late. So my question for you is, number one, have the Army planners from DA come to you to see, hey, what's your source code down at Quantico? Because we want to replicate that in the Army. And number two, would you have your peer from Army Futures Command welcome down to your Naval Board? Out to where? Uh, to your Naval Board. Sure. Yeah, no, so that, that, that's a great question. Um, and so I'll finish with the, the second part was um, I also co-chair the Army Marine Corps Board, and there's a lot of synergy there. So, you know, one side I'm working very close to the Department of the Army, the other side I'm working closely with the Navy, and there's a lot to learn from, from, from the great people that are working on both sides. Um, but very interesting you said, and we started getting word of this. So if you go back to history and look when we stood up McSiddick, TRADOC was stood up at about the same time, and they worked very closely to bring those two organizations to look very much alike. I have a monthly uh, synchronization meeting um, with General Perkins' staff in ARCIC, the Army um, Capability Integration uh, co uh, Command down there. General Master was there previously, General Dias is there now. Monthly meeting, we work closely together. My fear when I started hearing about this was it would do damage to the relationships that we have with TRADOC and ARCIC. So that was our concern. So the answer is yes. I've met with, I think, Lieutenant General Cardone. Uh, he was at a speaking engagement yesterday. But uh, yes, I've been working with him. Uh, they are asking us our ideas and how we're set up. I'm concerned when you do cross-functional teams that that can work for a while, but eventually you have to institutionalize what cross-functional teams do inside an organization. And typically organizations will fight cross-functional teams in the long term. So it's interesting to see how this works out. And I know uh, we certainly aren't the experts on it at all, but how to understand that modernization command and what those relationships with TRADOC will be in the future. We're very concerned with this because, like I said, the history, we kind of built those two organizations, us and them, to be able to work closely together. Go ahead, Sydney. Hi, sir. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about those uh, service, high-level leadership war games you mentioned, the one, the, re the recent one, but also the, the, the next one going ahead, building on that for, uh, for 18. You know, what are some of the new things you're doing in those games or things that you did a little bit in the past or doing much more of, you know, for especially this EW area, which keeps coming up in the Chinese video and in your talk? Uh, what are the ways those are building towards this reorientation on the high-end threat? Okay, that's a good question, uh, Sydney. Um, what we kind of did was we took 
the many war games that we've done with the Navy over about the last, I'd say probably 12 to 18 months. So we've been focused a lot on this threat over the last 12 to 18 months. I would say we've probably done um, eight to 10 war games with the Navy uh, on this area, between our Naval Surface War Game, whether they've been down at Quantico, down at Norfolk, or up at Newport. Those war games that we've been doing uh, to again drive into whether it's distributed maritime operations, low key, or even into the expeditionary advanced space operations. What we did uh, last month was for the senior leaders to try to coalesce specifically around expeditionary advanced space ops and how that would support sea control and a naval campaign. Uh, we pulled out a number of vignettes. Uh, from those other war games that we had done. The best ones that we thought would represent where we're trying to go with expeditionary advanced base operations. And then within each of those vignettes, we had three vignettes. What I had them do was uh, do um, probably three or four different concepts of employment within each one of those vignettes and play out how that concept of employment would be. Um, for example, one of the concepts of employment would be if we were going to conduct an amphibious landing with the ISR capabilities of a threat, how would we deceive, how would we deny, how would we hide our intentions, how would we operate and uh, conduct an amphibious op operation differently, many from what we learned in our ship to shore maneuver advanced naval technology, look at that uh, concept of employment and specifically look at what things do we have today that conduct the mission? What shortfalls do we have? What gaps we're looking at? And identified through each one of those concepts of employment of specific areas that we're going to drill into in our Palm 20 war game, which is going to be in March, which will be a real driver into what we put together into Palm 20. So it really came from all the war games we've done over the last year or so with the Navy looked at specific vignettes that were problem areas or ones that we thought we really had to get after. One would be, for example, how are we going to physically be able to move expeditionary advanced bases around quickly? How often, how large, what capabilities do we need to be able to move them so we can continue to deceive, deny the enemy um, of their location, just as I talked about kind of in the Ukraine scenario. Uh, and how we can use these as deterrence capabilities. So if that kind of gives you a broad piece of what we're trying to do in that, those kind of, um, the war game as we really drive into these concepts of employment, we can look at, for example, the ranges we have of our HIMARS capability of being able to hit ships. What capability do we have now on the HIMARS to be able to hit ships at sea that are moving? What can we do to improve the HIMARS capability right now? Is there a follow-on missile we can put into the HIMARS, or is it a follow-on system we have to buy? Is there a near, mid, and far-term uh, way to approach that problem? And then looking at the investment of it and where the divestiture and the offset going to come from. So clearly, as you look at that, going towards the high end, and we're focused on, and the Commandant gave clear guidance in his planning guidance, was to focus on the littorals, expedition advanced base ops. When we drill into that, if it's not competing in our palm for that area, then it's going to have a lower priority, and it may have been a higher priority in the past than it was uh, going to be in this environment. Yes, sir. Thank you, morning, sir. Scott Kinner with uh, the Marine Corps Tactics and Operations Group. Uh, question for you. So McTogg itself is doing a lot of war games for the GCE. Uh, we got to watch Sea Dragon out there in 29 Palms. Uh, we've seen Marine Corps Force 2025, which is kind of nibbling at the edges in some ways uh, for the ground combat element because we see what you're doing in McWill and uh, up at the higher end about trying to help the Navy get after their problem set. When you talk to the senior leadership in the last day and a half here, when you talk about naval integration, the first word so far out of everyone's mouth is the F-35. Not a battalion, not a company, not a regiment. So how do you see this, this effort to build a fifth generation MAGTAF that actually does sea service things, how do you see that thread being pulled to actually affect change of some sort where the GCE lives? Because the things as you know that your predecessors have bought and you're now fielding and what you're going to do is going to be uh, someone is going to enjoy 10 years from now, you know, those are bigger, they don't get on ships necessarily well. So, so I, I guess I'm looking from a GCE perspective, how are we going to go ahead and uh, support this fifth generation MAGTAF? Because the glue uh, doesn't seem to be there yet. 
Right. Thank you. No, that uh, great question. So I think this fifth generation urban Antex, you know, if you kind of take a look at it, it's what does that urban marine capability need to have to be able to operate in that complex environment? So littorals, operating in an urban littoral environment, um, be able to conduct uh, missions from the sea uh, into the urban littorals, uh, from expeditionary advanced bases into urban environments is one. And how that, how that fifth generation uh, Marine Corps is going to operate with some of the things we saw in the information um, world, uh, some of the EW capabilities we saw there, better fires, better reconnaissance. Um, I had a, a industry symposium on the advanced reconnaissance vehicle, and the reason I had that was industry was not bringing us any good ideas on what the advanced reconnaissance vehicle of the future should be. So if you want to do reconnaissance, it's not cavalry bumping into cavalry head on head. We want fifth generation capabilities like an F-35 that those Marines should have in the uh, LAR. Um, so that's an example of reconnaissance. What would reconnaissance look like in the future? We're going to have to think about that. Formations can look completely different with the capabilities we may be giving them. But a lot of this, when gets specific to the sea control piece, a lot of this may be uh, infantry units conducting raids, conducting choke point defense, and a lot of it's going to be guarding and helping us move expeditionary advance bases. That's going to be a part of the concept, and we're all going to have to pitch in to be able to try to meet the end state of what that means. So as we work through this, again, concepts will take plenty of time to allow and work through. But the, the fleet and our operating forces will, over time, will continue to drive us where we need to go. And one of the key things, I would say, you're coming from McTagg. We need more ideas out of McTagg. If I was getting half as much out of McTagg as I get out of WTI and MOTS that I'm going to on Friday, I'd be in heaven. But we're moving in the right direction, and we need key leaders like we have down at McTagg to try to help us with what they see going through our integrated training exercises, all the battle staff training that they're doing on where we need to be moving in the right direction. So, so you guys down there can help shape us where we need to go. Go ahead. Hello, Megan Eckstein, U.S. Naval Institute News. Um, I thought it was interesting in your early remarks talking about modernization that you included so much talk about training. Uh, typically, we only hear about the procurement side of modernization. So I wondered what the conversation was in the Marine Corps about incorporating training into your modernization efforts and how you're looking at sort of budgeting for that, that whole effort with total ownership costs included. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Megan. That's a real important question. One of the things I would say is, starting at the service level training, uh, Major General uh, Mullen, who's out at a MAGTAF training center out of 29 Palms, um, Commandant's given him a task to really increase the training out there to bring our service level training up to that high-end capability. So there's capabilities out there right now, for an example, of using swarming UASs on the Red Force side to be able to do force on force capabilities to get the Marines out there operating against a higher end threat, bringing electronic warfare capabilities in. So that's out there at MAGTAF DC. Um, but from the service level standpoint, one of the problems I think we have is trying to ensure that we've got the training embedded with everything we've done. These quadcopters that we just went on contractor contract with to get uh, quadcopters to every single squad in the Marine Corps. We just started sending 200 off a month at the end of last month to every squad. The training's not in place with that. So now we've got a working group looking at the facilities and the training, who gets the training, where they get the training. So a lot of this go fast, high exponential learning, we're going so fast that a lot of the dot mil PF institutional things we do are lagging behind. But um, we're going to have to continue to work that. But I would say the pressure is to go fast more in the modernization capabilities and try to catch up with the other pieces rather than get everything in place and then move forward. And I think the MIGs, our MEF information groups, are a perfect example of that. We put the structure in place. We gave them commanders. The structure is moving there. They don't have the equipment yet. They don't have the training yet. But those commanders will be putting the urgent needs in. They'll be driving us to continue to get that. And we're already seeing schools and training starting to happen in electronic warfare because the demand is going to be so high. Wow, what a great presentation, huh? Thank you very much. Boy, the message was uh, delivered and I hope it was received. There was something in there for just about everybody. If you didn't get it, you 
you were probably out too late last night. So again, uh, I want to thank uh, General Walsh for, for a great presentation. And uh, as I said, the message has been delivered. I think it's been received. Now it's time to get on with the job. So thank you all very much. We're really fortunate to have a gentleman of his experience, of his character, and his intellect, and the background that he's got to, to lead that effort down there at McCidic. And you can see there are more ideas and there are tremendous thought process going through, thought leadership going on. This is a very challenging time. And I really found it interesting when you referred back to the early days, Bob, because a lot of this stuff's coming back to live with us. So on behalf of, I want to thank you, and on behalf of AFCA yeah. and the Naval Institute, we want to present you this great book, Great Powers, Grand Strategies, The New Game in the South China Sea. No. It might be of interest. Very yes. much. Thank you, General. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move into a break in the